Yes, we need to know more about Mars to get more answers, Mars samples. Either rocks or even Mars dust will help us speed forward. John Morris will take us through this daring missing con concept to uncover answers about life and our universe, which will propel humanity forward, not just en route to Mars, but which will advance science, technology, and society itself. John, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. I have to go with my glasses whenever I do anything technical. So um, this is a uh, mission which was conceived actually in the early 2000s, but it's still uh, relevant today because we really, really want to bring samples back from Mars for a variety of reasons that you've heard of uh, during the course of uh, the conference here. But in particular, in the last couple of years, it has become more and more uh, relevant to the design of long-term Mars uh, uh, habitation and uh, keeping humans in a sustainable habitat there that we want to understand the dust. Uh, the, the scientific results from rovers and remote sensing uh, show that the, the dust is complicated and uh, we want to understand potential hazards uh, and other things like that. So this is a concept for returning dust from the atmosphere of Mars without landing. And that's how this particular limited sample return uh, is much cheaper. So here's an iconic Hubble image uh, from uh, 2001 showing Mars on a clear day and then on uh, a global uh, dusty storm taking over the uh, planet. And as we know, last year, one of these buried uh, the Opportunity rover. And so no matter where you go on Mars, you cannot avoid the dust. And so the idea is to bring some home. And so we'd like to get timely dust samples. Uh, we want to uh, address science from National Academy reports. There's also a NASA engineering and safety uh, council um, report recently about the potential hazards of dust. Uh, we want to understand Mars geology, uh, etc., and also address planetary protection protocols sooner than later because we know that those will increase in complexity as we do landed sample return and deliberately target the search for life. Uh, and returning those samples to the Earth. And then, of course, we've all been talking about humans going to Mars uh, and the potential consequences if there is a Martian biosphere. Um, so let me go to a video. And there's, the video is a, a few years old, and so some of the titles uh, for the people have changed. But you will recognize the participants in the video, and uh, they, they talk a little bit about Mars in general, which I think is good at the end of the, uh, the conference here. Skim, sample collection to investigate Mars. Mars has been an incredibly fascinating planet for me from a long time. Um, as an undergraduate studying geology in the foothills of the Himalayas, I often wondered about what some of the other planets like Mars and Venus were really like and what rocks from those places were really like. I have a vivid memory of being a 10-year-old girl standing in my mother's kitchen in Phoenix, Arizona, and looking at the pages of Time magazine and seeing the images from the Viking landers when they set down on the surface of Mars the first time any human-made object had ever landed on Mars. And I saw those pictures and I was drawn in. I wanted to reach out and touch those rocks. I wanted to run my fingers through that soil. And ever since then, I've been pretty obsessed with Mars. To me, the thing that has always set Mars apart among all the planets is that it is the one planet that is most like Earth that we can imagine life as we know it, possibly having taken hold there. And so by studying Mars, we can learn about our place in the solar system, our place in the cosmos, and perhaps learn about how life first evolves in ways that are very difficult to do anywhere else. Well, I was very, very fortunate uh, to be the son of a rocket scientist. My dad worked on the Apollo program when I was very young, and so 
I grew up with the ambition to set the very first footprint down on Mars. I became an astronaut, I flew five space shuttle missions, incredible missions up into space. Didn't quite get a chance to, uh, to land on Mars, but I know that one day, uh, you know, Skim will fly and future astronauts will land on Mars on the shoulders of all the work that's come before. So I think this is a very exciting time to be alive and a very exciting mission uh, to pursue. Beginning its journey to return dust samples from Mars, Skim first configures itself for its cruise to the Red Planet. So that's the key reason I've chosen to be involved with the Skim mission, and that I see it as a high reward compared to the risk. The system development is amenable to streamlined management because it's fundamentally based on technical factors that can be controlled rather than risk factors that need to be managed. We have control of the mission because we have control not only of the requirements but also the method of implementation. Technology is also proven, so we are in an evolutionary rather than revolutionary mode of development. And finally, with Lockheed Martin, we have a proven partner. After its initial cruise to Mars, Skim prepares to collect its dust samples during its Mars Aeropass by ejecting the covers from its aerogel collectors and stowing its antenna and solar arrays. The cone-shaped Skim spacecraft soars 14,000 miles per hour at a shallow angle through the Martian atmosphere, collecting its dust samples about 25 miles above the surface. A slow roll keeps the spacecraft stable while the aerogel collectors capture impacting dust towards the aft end of the spacecraft where temperatures are much lower than at the nose. Skim emerges from the Martian atmosphere without going into orbit, reconfigures itself for interplanetary travel, and is directed back to Earth through a deep space thruster burn. As Skim approaches the Earth after its interplanetary flight, the sample return capsule containing its precious cargo from Mars is ejected from the aft end of the spacecraft and plunges into the Earth's atmosphere. A heat shield protects the capsule during descent, then parachutes deploy to bring the capsule to a gentle desert landing. And this is when the great science of Skim begins. Our team of leading scientists will extract the dust grains from the collectors and we will send them to the best laboratories in the world. We will study the chemistry and the structure of the dust grains and decipher the history of Mars. So what's going to be amazing is after the capsule lands on Earth, our recovery team will go get it and bring it back and then we're ready for our preliminary examination. Imagine the first time that we're opening that capsule and really seeing this microscopic rock collection that we brought back from Mars. So the dust on Mars is really special because it forms this global layer. So a scoop of this dust, which is essentially what we'll have, is like a miniature rock collection from Mars that represents all the different rock types in the Martian surface. So just by studying what different kinds of minerals are there in great detail, we'll learn about the diversity of rock types on Mars by studying how altered and chemically weathered they are, we'll learn about water on Mars. And by understanding specifics of their chemical makeup, we'll learn great details about the Martian environment and whether it might have been hospitable for life. There are two ways to get a global understanding of Mars. Either you can go to an enormous number of places and bring examples from all of those places, or you can bring back a sample of something that is from everywhere and distributed everywhere. And that's the ubiquitous Martian dust, the soil. Um, and what that does is it tells you about the average Mars, what the bulk composition of the crust is like, and that contains lots of information about how crustal formation processes operate on Mars. Mars is one of four terrestrial planets. There's also Mercury and Venus and Earth, and it fits somehow into that overall picture. But to understand how it fits in, you need to understand how, how the planet works, how it turns itself inside out and creates its crust. And the only way to do that is to, is to understand the composition of the crust globally. And so getting a sample of this dust that's everywhere um, is, is going to be an incredibly valuable thing. So SKIM is an incredibly exciting, groundbreaking mission for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's going to be the first round trip ever to Mars. 
And secondly, it'll be the first ever sample return from Mars. So in a couple of ways, we'll be completely doing something new. I'm very, very excited about the SKIM mission as a precursor to human exploration of the Red Planet. We're going to be taking uh, an aeropass through the upper reaches of the atmosphere, basically characterizing the aerodynamics to help prepare for a human uh, lander at some point in the future, and then also collecting ground truth, actual samples from the Red Planet, and bringing them home to really ground our observations from satellites as well as robotic probes that have been there. Having samples brought back to Earth, analyzed in our laboratories, and then applying that knowledge to the future designs of, of spacecraft systems will be key. So this is the most important thing I'm going to say. Skim has a mission to achieve out-of-box science by deploying in-the-box technology. So the bottom line is that every system element proposed has been done before, and it's already qualified for its application on Skim. Bringing samples back from Mars to Earth is so critical because we have the very best equipment in labs here. Most of these pieces of equipment take up a whole laboratory. You couldn't put them on a spacecraft and send them to Mars. We want to tear these dust grains apart, atom by atom, and really understand what they're made of. And to do that, you need to do it in labs on Earth. There is no way around it. Getting humanity's first glimpse at something no one's ever seen before. Whether it's the surface of Pluto or holding in your hand a grain of dust that was captured from Mars, um, it is compelling stuff. And uh, anytime you do something, you only get to do something for the first time once. And that's what excites me about skin. It's going to be the first Mars ever. And then the boldly go. I did this on my piano. <laughs> so the, the key to the mission then is uh, not landing and going during the dusty season, which can be essentially forecast. We have uh, a number of those mapped out now by uh, not just uh, terrestrial observations, but in situ spacecraft in orbit, uh, mapping the, uh, and on the surface, of course, mapping the opacity and the dust content. Um, so there's upcoming opportunities to execute a mission um, like this, and this is a, a tentative profile that's been worked out where uh, you can launch in 2024 timeframe, do your AeroPass in 2025, and be back on Earth with samples by 2027. And the neat thing about this particular opportunity, which uh, is, is worked out uh, when they do these trajectory forecasts, is this particular one has a free return trajectory where your delta V from uh, Mars is zero nominally. Now, of course, you have to take some fuel because you probably won't be 0, 0.000. You'll probably have a small uh, deviation that you'll need to correct. But in the original incarnation of the SKIM mission, uh, at least a third of the volume was just the fuel to get home. And so now if that is an order of magnitude less, you can start to make a smaller space vehicle with less mass and in fact, what we hope to do is make it such that we might be able to fit uh, co-manifested with other uh, spacecraft that are going to Mars. So this is a synopsis of the fact that we can target the dusty seasons uh, when, when uh, these occur on Mars uh, with our launch date and our AeroPass. Uh, we have uh, mission design, which is uh, uh, predicated on previous missions like the Stardust mission that went and captured uh, dust particles from a comet's tail in aerogel. That's the technique we use. There have been wind tunnel tests of the, the shape, and this shape goes back uh, all the way to the 50s. Uh, it's a, a Langley shape. Uh, and this is a lot more like a vehicle that might take humans to the surface in, uh, at Mars 
And so there's interest in outfitting the aeroshell out here with the type of sensors that you would put on a Mars Science Laboratory or the Mars 2020 rover, but this would have a different shape and, and take those uh, initial readings. And then, as I mentioned, there's uh, wind tunnel tests and, and temperature uh, simulations, so we understand the mission well. And so these are the key features that we can bring home hundreds of uh, roughly 10 micron particles and uh, a couple thousand smaller particles, uh, the way, the kind of samples we need to understand uh, the makeup of the dust. Um, we would push the planetary protection protocols, which uh, as you heard Lisa Pratt here say, you know, there's a lot of work to do uh, and doing things from uh, the landed Mars sample return uh, is a uh, high level of complexity in both forward and backward contamination. This is much easier in forward contamination. It's more like an orbiter mission. And then we only worry about the backward contamination. And there, there's probably no more benign situation of returning samples to the Earth than from the upper atmosphere of Mars. And so it moves the process along. We look at uh, doing this with public-private partnership. Um, and you could even implement this as uh, a service, uh, like they're doing with CLIPS. It's not that there's a commercial, um, commercial uh, market for doing uh, these missions over and over. Uh, however, uh, industry knows how to do this. And uh, we could do this with a lot less overhead than uh, a typical mission uh, funded by NASA. Uh, uh, and finally, as I mentioned, we might be able to co-manifest uh, by shrinking the vehicle. And we, everybody knows we want to have uh, a comm relay at Mars. We, we all know that. And we're looking out into the mid and late 20s time frame. And we would love to have uh, something there so not, we're not relying on spacecraft that are literally two decades old in order to provide those relay surfaces. So uh, thank you very much. And let's go get uh, bring Mars home. Thank you. Go. Sure. Okay. You want to run up to the microphone? I love this. You got it down to the simplest common denominator. It can be done on a low budget. Uh, my last job in, in corporate world was international sales manager of a telecom company. My engineer would come in when I made a mistake and say, Jack, what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture is possible. At the point of re-entry, one of those vessels holding that dust breaks loose and falls into the Earth's atmosphere, okay? I'm just saying. You know, con a contingency, okay? Uh, uh, I'll repeat it. Uh, your own re-entry, one of those vessels holding the dust breaks open and spills all that dust into the Earth's atmosphere. Just a possibility. Right. This is uh, the planetary protection protocols in that uh, we would have a design that doesn't do that. Uh, you, would, you would have to uh, make sure that you don't have a catastrophic failure on Earth return. Um, uh, again, this, uh, if, if people are familiar with the Earth return, there was Genesis and then there was Stardust. One of them, the first, uh, failed to have its parachutes deploy. Uh, the second one went fine. Um, and we'll have OSIRIS-REx and, and other samples returned. And it's that heritage that we build on. And then we would have a uh, return system that uh, avoids the catastrophic uh, situation you're talking about by design. But thanks for the reminder. One other question? Yes, um, given that scenario, uh, wouldn't it be a consideration, even without that scenario, to have a uh, uh, a place in orbit around Earth where you first uh, bring it, the materials back so you can do an initial assessment of how dangerous or not dangerous they are. Then you bring it down to the Earth for, for further uh, assessment. Um, there are people in the audience and on the next panel and who have spoken previously who, who could address 
that issue uh, very directly because they, they live this issue of planetary protection and, and how to mitigate the risks. Uh, this is a huge issue because it's partially psychological and not just technical. And um, the idea is, you know, some people think that we're going to do our Mars sample return with astronauts' boots on the ground on Mars and returning to the habitat uh, for analysis uh, in order to keep the Earth's biosphere isolated. Uh, there are other uh, ideas for capturing in cislunar space or low Earth orbit in order to look at the samples before returning them to Earth. This concept doesn't have propulsion to do that, um, but we do follow the protocols, as you see when you have a little return spacecraft, which uh, is disconnected from anything that touched Mars, and the mother ship goes off uh, into infinity. Um, and so this idea that we would uh, examine returned samples off-world before putting them on the ground is something that people are thinking about, and that was part of the discussion of the Lunar Gateway. Um, so we'll see how that evolves and how these protocols go along, and it will definitely be an international effort uh, to work all these out. And you know, I think Lisa Pratt uh, is right on top of this kind of uh, uh, consideration. Thank you. But thanks again, everyone.